Okay, um, panel members, we're ready to get started if you want to go ahead. Okay, thank you everyone for being here. Thanks for taking time out of your busy evening to join us and our esteemed guests, the award-winning filmmakers of SOS, the San Onofre Syndrome. Mary Beth Brangan, producer and Jim Heddle host, Morgan, I'm sorry, Jim Heddle, co-director, Morgan Peterson, their co-director is unable to be with us tonight, but sends her best wishes to all. My co-moderator this evening is Libby Halevi, the brilliant and dynamic producer and host of Nuclear Hot Seat. The voice of all things nuclear from a different perspective. Libby is the 2022 recipient of the Nuclear Free Future Award and serves as ambassador to the US for the International Uranium Film Festival. She also authored the book, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby, for being here with me today. It's my honor. Good, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so Mary Beth Brangan, who is with us, is producer and a filmmaker, an experienced organizer at the community, state, and international levels. She helped found a successful movement to prevent the construction of a nuclear waste dump in Ward Valley, California, which would have infiltrated the Colorado River, the source of drinking water for millions of people. James Heddle is co-director and director of photography. Jim has directed, shot, and edited over 19 documentaries and hundreds of video news reports. He taught film production at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Concordia University, Montreal, and other educational institutions. Morgan Peterson, co-director and editor of the film, as I mentioned, is unable to be with us, but I'm gonna read her creds because they're very impressive. She was the producer for the 2018 Oscar-nominated short film, DeKalb Elementary, and the feature documentary, Bronies, the extreme, extremely unlikely adult fans of My Little Pony in 2012. I would love to have hosted a webinar on that film. <laughs> Morgan is also the writer director for the award winning shorts I'll Take Care of You and The Greats. So, this event marks the kickoff of the 11th annual Becquerel Awareness Days, April 10th through 13th, which is hosted by Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. My name is Kimberly Roberson. Some know me as Kim. I'm the founder and director of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. I've known Jim and Mary Beth for over 30 years. We met in coalition when I was with Greenpeace and we were organizing to block the Ward Valley proposed radioactive waste dump in the 1990s. Later, I was truly blessed to work with their wonderful nonprofit, E.ON, the Ecological Options Network. After that time, I returned to San Francisco to study holistic nutrition, and worked in that field for many years, and I still do. In March of 2011, when Fukushima exploded, I was horrified, as many of you were. Having worked at Greenpeace in 1989 on the East-West campaign, a few weeks after Chernobyl began, I well understood without hesitation that radioactive fallout from Japan was coming down in the spring rainfall of March of 2011. I wrote a change.org petition and gathered signatures calling on the US government for food monitoring beginning April 1st of 2011. That led to the formation of the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. Eon and FAN worked alongside Citizens for Health and Beyond Nuclear to draft and file a citizen petition with FDA to lower the current allowable levels for man made radiation in our food supply. I need to mention the late, great Jim Turner with Citizens for Health. Jim was absolutely instrumental in crafting and filing our citizen petition. It's actually a legal document that requires FDA response. And regardless of what the industry tells us, there is no safe dose of radiation, nor is man-made radiation good for you. This is one from our series Radioactive red herrings, what the nuclear industry does not tell you. This is fans red herring number nine, a little radiation is good for you. The industry term is actually hormesis. And the truth is there is no safe dose as found by the National Academies of Sciences, Beer 7 report. 
the health risks from exposure to low levels of ionizing radiation, which was published in 2006. For almost 20 years, biology professor Tim Mousseau has investigated the effects of nuclear disaster radiation. This past summer, he spoke at a press conference in Seoul, South Korea. You most likely did not read about it in the Western press. He stated that the vast majority of published studies, 250 in all that he helped to compile, indicate that exposure, especially internal, can have significant biological consequences, including damage to DNA, reduced fertility, longevity, and elevated risk of diseases, including cancer. We'll get back to that, more on the health impacts and on food in the center, uh, I'm sorry, in the second part of the presentation. I'll mention that Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network has a series of actions and events taking place this week as part of our 11th annual Becquerel Awareness Days 2024, one that is specifically focused on the food issue. Information for all events will be shared in the follow-up email after the event. So let's get underway. First, we'll watch a compelling video clip compiled by the filmmakers entitled SOS, The Fukushima, California Connection. Then Libby will start the discussion with Mary Beth and Jim. story on Midday Edition. The decommissioning of the shuttered San Onofre nuclear power plant is continuing even as controversies still rage over the storage of spent nuclear fuel. A regular quarterly meeting of the San Onofre Community Engagement Panel took place in Oceanside last night. The subject Southern California Edison presented was current practices in the transportation of used nuclear fuel. The problem is, it's still not known where, when, or if ever the spent fuel being buried behind a seawall at San Onofre will be moved. Joining me is the severe nuclear accident was just missed by a quarter inch. You've got 40% of the cargo exports and Im imports for the country, 40% of the agriculture products for the country, and we're allowing incompetent companies like Southern California Edison and Holtec to determine our future. We don't want this nuclear waste buried at the beach, just above the water level, 100 feet from the ocean. Who thought of this? This is crazy. What are you going to do when one of these canisters fails? You just realize that they don't want those questions. They can't handle those questions. Public safety should be first. And I've been around nuclear for many years. It's not. Behind that gate, it's not. The story has been changing since this explosion took place some four hours ago. And, and the Prime Minister is saying that this, combined with the earthquake, is the most severe, unprecedented crisis that Japan has faced. Experts are warning that radiation levels now are rising at the Fukushima nuclear plant. And there is a high risk, they are saying, of a leak if the situation isn't resolved. They spoke of the hundreds and thousands of evacuees now headed away from those nuclear power reactors that have caused so much trouble. The line of cars stretched for miles, a race to get out of the danger zone. 200,000 people and counting, trying to get away from those battered nuclear reactors. This man said nuclear power is the most frightening thing, even more than a tsunami. The government, nobody tells us, the citizens, what is really happening. We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. 
Fresh reports from the EPA and others in this country show traces of radiation from that Japanese plant have migrated across the Pacific Ocean, have now reached a total of 14 states here that we know of, including Florida and New York. If you look at the Fukushima disaster, which they say now will run up to about $500 billion, that disaster is 20% of the fallout from that disaster. And that was because that power plant sits on the coast with an offshore wind con prevailing wind condition. Here at San Onofre, it's the complete opposite. We have a prevailing westerly on the west coast, which means almost all of the fallout from a nuclear disaster would be traveling into Southern California's urbanized areas. Now, where do these radioactive materials come from? Well, there is a naturally occurring radioactive material in nature called uranium. Uranium is very special because it was discovered in 1939 that you could split the uranium atom and release an enormous amount of energy. All nuclear weapons are based on uranium. But when this uranium is used in a nuclear reactor, it is split in hundreds of different ways. It's a violent process triggered by neutrons that are flying around. I have a list of 211 different radioactive materials which are produced at every nuclear reactor, and that's not a complete list. The difficulty with radioactive materials is the atoms are unstable. They're like little time bombs, and they explode without warning. And if they explode inside your body, they damage the cells, and they damage in particular the DNA molecules, and that can cause cancer because the cells begin to reproduce abnormally. And the same thing happens with uh, reproductive cells. If your reproductive cells, the eggs or sperm, are damaged, then you can pass this on to your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And so generations hence, people can be suffering from consequences of a radiation exposure today. This stuff remains dangerous for literally millions of years. We created something that will haunt not just human lives, but all other species as well um, for a period that is incomprehensible. I mean. I have trouble imagining a human lifespan, which, you know, is tiny, 70, 80 years. We're talking about half a million years. Waste that is toxic. And plutonium is dangerous for, has a half-life of 24,000 years. That means in 24,000 years, there's still half of it. In 48,000 years, there's still a quarter of it. We measure dangerous periods in generally 10 to 20 half-lives. So that's about half a million years. But it doesn't disappear. It turns into a brand new substance, which is called uranium-235, which has a 700 million year half-life. So uh, this is a very perplexing problem. から特に最初の1週間経験したことを少しお話をさせていただきたいと思います。サンデイ11の10時46分私の全ての原発が停止したという情報でした。それを聞いた時にはホッとしました。しかし、それから約1時間後に来た情報は、え、福島第一サイトで全ての電源が喪失したという情報でした。え、この電源喪失と冷却機能が停止ということが何を意味するか
、まあ、日本の例で言えば国土の3分の1の地域から逃げていくあるいは人口の 40% がその場所から逃げるそのことが必要となる事故というのは戦争を除けばありえない事故だと思っています。まあ、そう考えるとこのリスクの大きさに対してえそうしたリスクを 100% 回避するえリスクを回避できる方法というのはそれは原発を使わないでもいい社会を作るそのことです。Five years, the San Onofre nuclear plant is shutting down for good. To clear out the uncertainty and move forward in a decisive way,、uh, as well as、uh, reduce the drag that、uh, was continuing,、uh, the economic drag from having the plant, we decided to、uh, no longer seek restart、uh, and close the plant. If you take Edison on their word, then you'd also have to be deeply insulted by. Their assertion that they made that decision based on economic grounds. Okay, you ready?、Yay! So, in other words, my children's safety meant nothing to them. That all the issues that were being raised meant nothing to them, that it was an economic bottom line. And so, my thought there is、um, Edison didn't learn a single lesson from Fukushima. This has ramifications around the country. This is a seismic event in the nuclear industry. And it was nothing one particular person or group did. It was the culmination of people coming together. I hope we're a good example to other people in our situation. I got this letter、uh, from Mr. Khan just、uh, shortly after the decision, Edison's decision to shut down San Onofre. I'll just read it to you here. It's.、Um, It says, Dear Mr. Johnson, I appreciate what you did for me while I was staying in California the other day. Thanks to you and Southern Californians, I was able to exchange meaningful opinions with Mr. Yasko, Mr. Bradford, Mr. Gunderson, and also strongly feel that Southern Californians were enthusiastic about the abolition of nuclear power plants. The news that the nuclear power plant in San Onofre would be abolished was reported right after I came back to Japan. It was the result that your persistent activities bore fruit. I am happy to have been involved in, that in the course of that. I would like you to help me make networks to abandon nuclear power plants, not only in the USA and Japan, but all over the world. I am looking forward to seeing you again. Yours sincerely, Naoto Khan. And I got a call that morning from the LA Times. I wanted to get my take on the shutdown. This is just the beginning. And I immediately just said, I'm glad it's shut down, but now we got to deal with the waste. There's no way in the world that we are going to allow this nuclear power plant to become a nuclear waste dump for 200 years. Thank you. San Onofre syndrome can be fixed, but we have to fix it here first. Wow. <laughs> I've seen the full film, but even seeing this clip made me very emotional in places, going through the journey in miniature, seeing the faces, some of whom are not with us anymore, and realizing what a monument to the monumental work that was done you have created. So, my congratulations to you, Mary Beth, you, Jim,、uh, and also.、Um, Morgan. <laughs> Morgan. I was looking for her name.、Um, for having done such a remarkable job.
Um, having seen the whole film, I can attest to the fact that it sets a pace where the information is delivered in a way that is clear, concise, in normal English and not nuke speak so that anybody can understand without being overwhelmed. The editing is precise, specific, and there's absolutely no fat in this at all. You have made this a very lean, fast-moving film. So the big question is, when you started making this film, did you expect that it would take 12 years to finish the documentary? And was it difficult to know when it was time to stop? No, we sure didn't know. <clears throat> there was no way to know what the story would be. Um, it, we it set out just like Kim, we were horrified by what happened with Fukushima and uh, determined that we had to do everything we could possibly do to uh, prevent that from happening here in California, where our nuclear reactors also sit surrounded by earthquake faults and in tsunami zones, just like Fukushima did. Do you want to say anything? Well, we had originally uh, planned to cover both San Onofre and uh, the Alblue Canyon, but it became too complicated, uh, the interweaving stories. So we uh, backed off and just focused on San Onofre. And it was a moving target. Uh, it still is, in fact. <laughs> the story is never quite over with this topic, but uh, I think we've timed it right so that uh, our film has a chance of still impacting the final decision on the waste management process and can set an example to other reactor communities around the country and around the world because this is uh, not specific to San Onofre, although some of the characteristics of the specific situation are unique. Uh, this is a syndrome that affects uh, reactor sites across the across the world, really. Right, and I wanted to add that, um, uh, along with starting the video project, we were very concerned about the food situation, and that's why we and in the fallout, um, we had so much rain right after the explosions, and we knew. We knew, just like Kim, it was bad. It was really, really bad. And uh, we started um, learning whatever we could about how to deal with that aspect of it, too. So. It's been very encouraging because uh, we, we found people all up and down the coast that were uh, right on the story from the beginning and have hung in there. And that's uh, what it takes. Uh, Eisenhower famously called it an alert and vigilant, uh, an informed and vigilant populace is the only uh, solution for this stuff. And it's still true. Mm -hmm. We're hoping our film can stimulate uh, an informed and vigilant populace to speak up and uh, have an impact, as we can see that they do, if they can, if they if they do. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that was so remarkable about the film was how you spotlighted so many different activist actions that were taking place and showed people in the process of doing the work and speaking truth to power. Safe energy and anti-nuclear activists can learn a lot about your documentary as regards tactics and strategies because you showed them so well. Just one example, and I'd like to hear any others you can you would like to highlight from the film. But one example I particularly enjoyed was Dan Hirsch. Of it wasn't the, Dan. It was Torgan Johnson. Was it Torgan who came up with this? Tor Torgan. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Dan voiced it here, but it was Torgan's strategy and tactic to explain how at the San Onofre hearings, activists, and this is by design, are only given three minutes to talk and then they have to shut up and move on. And there's no time to really make a point in three minutes, not a compelling one. So what happened was they broke 
the full argument down into three minute segments, gave a different segment to a different activist. They got in line in order so that the full message was delivered, but it was delivered by a mosaic of voices, but it was a continuity of message. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant and something that could be used by activists who are similarly hogtied uh, when they go to give their testimony too. What lessons, other lessons, do you feel we get a chance to see from this film that can be applied for activists in other parts of the country, other parts of the world? Well, first of all, you can't trust the agencies, the regulatory agency. That's a big one. Um, you can't trust the utilities. And you can barely trust the local authorities. And so the big lesson is we all have to take uh, responsibility on ourselves. What else, Jim? <laughs> well, the, yeah, the the, um, the inactivity and compromised nature of the regulatory process. I'm sure many of viewers are familiar with the term uh, uh, regulatory capture, where uh, the agencies that are charged with regulating the industries end up being regulated by the industries themselves. So it's a, it's an endemic uh, situation and it, it really needs to be acknowledged and addressed. That, also, that's what we're hoping the film will have an impact on uh, removing the blinders from this, from this issue. And uh, persistence. <clears throat> they, I think um, everybody was really in for the long haul and they persisted and kept on. I mean, the people on the East Coast right now uh, who are um, taking advantage of the opportunity to educate people about the dumping of um, the radioactive wastewater as they're, <clears throat> excuse me, are uh, they're uh, reactors are being decommissioned, that's, uh, they're showing the same kind of using the opportunities to educate the, the surrounding communities um, that was shown in San Onofre so well. Um, they they um, demanded action and people were very, very um, responsive. I mean, when they find out the, the truth, uh, people respond appropriately, I think. That's why we spent a significant amount of the film on the, the process uh, and the drama of actually getting the thing shut down. Uh, but the, the second take home is that shutdown is only the beginning. And that's, uh, that's the open-ended nature of this uh, ongoing narrative at the moment. That was another thing, the structure of the piece. It's really like you had two different, not two different films. It was, there was a continuity to it, but at the same time, it was very definitely in the beginning, it was all about, we've got to get it shut down. We've got to get it shut down and what it took to get there and yay. But then comes the work and the reality of what came after that. How hard was it or how much harder was it to get into the recovery phase or the getting rid of the waste or dealing with it, making people aware that the problem was continuing as opposed to we've got to shut it down? Well, I think what um, the activists found out was that it was harder because um People went back to sleep after, oh, it's closed, it's shut down, it's easy um, to relax now. We don't have to worry about a meltdown. And uh, But um, dear Gary Hedrick and um, others um, are continuing to plug after the problem here because now, um, as you know, the severe weather has caused the cliffs surrounding the plant to crumble. The um, railroad line has had to be stopped multiple times because of landslides that goes along there, uh, along the bluffs. 
uh, it, uh, groundwater is rising and this stuff is only inches above groundwater at the best inches like uh you know less than three feet and um uh, so the ocean is rising faster than they expected and um meanwhile the groundwater is too so uh, that is putting a lot of um pressure to do something much quicker than the industry wants to um they they say that the utility says they don't want to leave it there at the beach but um they didn't try very hard to make other arrangements in fact there is no plan uh to deal with this now nothing so um we're fortunate to have a, a local uh, a legislator in that area, um, a city council person from Irvine, uh, to, uh, who is working very hard to get uh, some legislation passed so that there can be some action taken by the state to make a plan to um, safeguard the health and uh, welfare of of that area of Southern California. And it wouldn't be just that area. As we know, we can see from the animation and from what happened at Fukushima, it moves everywhere. It's, it's clear that the nuclear waste management industry is a growth industry with a great future uh, for profit makers and uh, unscrupulous op people because uh, there's more and more nuclear waste piling up, no sign of stopping, and uh, they're using the the cover story of decommissioning individual reactor sites for uh, clearing the way to build fleets of small modular reactors that are built as the only way we can be saved from climate change. So it's a very complicated uh, story, and there's no uh, uniform, universal consensus on really what to do about it. There's great uh, emphasis and attraction to uh, deep geological burial, which, uh, as Gordon uh, Edwards and others have pointed out, is it's abandonment, not uh, not stewardship because once you get it buried, it, uh, it's, it's not under the control of human uh, conscious uh, policy anymore. It's uh, pretty much locked away out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. Other people for, uh, uh, favor deep boreholes, just deep, uh, dig deep into the earth and s slot the, slide the things down where they'll be uh, un inspectable and out of uh, reach there, so yeah. so the the what we're suggesting uh, is a is a rational uh, uh, approach that's based on what we can do now and what we can learn in the future because you can't get it to deep geological burial there is none right now and uh, it's going to possibly be decades or never before such a site is developed and approved. So meanwhile, we have to do the best we can with what we've got. And that's what we're, that's why we're advocating uh, rolling stewardship as uh, the best interim policy until a more robust and uh, uh rational, effective solution can be found, which may not ever occur. It was so there is a, an example of the technology that we are advocating to con consider, um, which is in Switzerland, and it's what they're using for the interim, their interim storage. Um, and the, the way you have to handle this fuel the spent fuel um, there because the technology does not exist right now 
for putting it all in one place, the transportation, we cover the transportation uh, problems in, in the film. And we also, uh, the risk uh, of uh, transportation is incredible. And, um, and we also cover the environmental injustice of moving it uh, to somewhere else and putting it uh, in someone else's backyard. And of course, um, uh, poor minority uh, areas are, and and Native American tribes are usually targeted. There are two main issues. One is that uh, at the moment, the fuel rods are uh, locked away, out of sight, out of mind, uh, inaccessible for inspection as to how what damages they may have uh, uh, may have already uh, suffered or will from moving the stuff around. The other one is uh, the degradation of the canisters themselves, which are highly subject to corrosion, cracking, and degradation from exposure to water and sea air and so on. So. Uh, it's a very knotty problem, and it's not susceptible to easy, sloganized answers, which everybody <laughs> from the decision makers on down to the activists would love to have, but it's just not there. The film has been shown at individual venues, uh, several of them here in Southern California. What has been the response of audiences, especially those who are relatively local to San Onofre after they've had a chance to see the film? Well, in San Clemente, half of the audience stayed and were very energized. And the other half got out of there quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I hope it's... Um, uh, continues to build the audience. And, and we're going to be having a week of free screenings so that people, uh, there's no block from um, being able to watch it. And we hope to get it out more and more. The um, people in the East Coast um, that have responded, it, it's moving. Actually, I was uh, sort of surprised both in all of the areas where it's been shown so far, New Mexico and the East Coast, Cape Cod, and uh, in Southern California, um, there, the local politicians have responded. They realized they need to do something and they came out for it. And um, more decision makers than I thought were very moved to, to wanna do more and to understand more. Yeah, they, we're getting really good feedback uh, in terms of quotable quotes. One is from an activist in the, in the East that says it was really made for activists to use to help educate the public. Uh, elsewhere from uh, friendly critics who you wouldn't necessarily expect to have been, you know, we've been called the, probably the the best um, nuclear documentary on nuclear safety I've ever seen, uh, one prominent nuclear expert said. So I think we're on a roll. We've already won uh, two awards in two of the festivals we've entered, and we've been accepted in three so far and counting. So we're hoping that the film will make its way in the world and uh, fulfill its intended purpose yeah i have to add i i think like an activist because i or i identify as an organizer and as an activist and so i we structured it for activists to use as an organizing tool yeah mary beth really stepped in at the end and guided our process to make it uh activist friendly I know that for all the time that I've been doing Nuclear Hot Seat and covering the events around San Onofre, every time I showed up, the two of you were there with a full 
camera get up mm. and you were filming. Mm -hmm. And I can only, you know, I face my own editing every week, but I'm just doing an hour podcast. You guys had, I cannot imagine how much film footage that you had to sift through to find the gems that you strung together into this, this film. How did you, through your process, make your selections of what that material was? You know, at, I, at, what, good old Morgan, she was fabulous at um, pulling out storylines uh, to tell the story rather than just say what we wanted to, you know, like a lecture. Um, and what, um, what I did at the end was to sift through all the, the statements for ethical statements for the value statements. And I think that's that's why um, it worked. We were, I was sorting for the highest principles uh, that were articulated. It certainly came across. Again, even in that excerpt that you showed, I found it very moving to hear what people were saying and the conviction with which they were saying and the care and the concern for themselves, for their families, for the environment. Right. So in terms of distribution of the film, you talk about wanting to get it available for a week of screenings. What kind of distribution is going and when is it going to show up on Netflix? Oh, <laughs> well, we do. We It's in process to be um, available on Apple and Amazon and all of those things that's in process it takes a couple of months you know this was just released mm -hmm. and um we're also we're deciding right now we're um working with the uh producer of Atomic Bamboozle who's a professor herself uh professor Meredith to um get her wisdom because what we want to do is go directly to academic organizations and um, libraries and make sure that we could uh, get this into the uh, curriculum and into the libraries for the young people to understand because they're so flooded now with the propaganda about mm -hmm. uh, how we have to have more nuclear. We're very blessed to be working with a wonderful group of women, uh, Mocha Media, they're a new um, a profession, really. Impact campaigners. Impact campaign uh, managers. It's new to us. <laughs> and uh, it's a whole new way of approaching film distribution through a variety of vectors. And they've done a ma mag magnificent job, both of hand-holding us through the maze of new environment, but also generating wonderful visuals and uh, publicity materials. We're just, we can't uh, thank them more than we all we do on a daily basis. <laughs> and we have um, a, a website, sandinofresyndrome.com, that will take people to um, the platform that it's being offered on right now, which is Eventive, um, while we're but, you know, eventually it'll be on the other ones too. But Eventive has been used by Sundance. Um, so it's a very good platform as well. I mean, these in the past, we've just made documentaries and, you know, after a few films or uh, film festivals or awards, we just let them go off in the world and make their own way. But this one we want wanted to really launch with a, a lot more vigor because it's so needed right now. And for people who are on this webinar right now and who may be listening to it at some future time, if they want to have San Onofre syndrome, SOS San Onofre syndrome shown in their community, right? What what would they do in order to make that connection with you? Go to our website and follow the directions. It says host a screening, punch here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a button that says host a screening. Yes, a, a drop down, you know. 
Yeah. It, and when we send things out, we constantly um, encourage people to uh, consider hosting a screening. And you can write to us. You can um, send us messages through the website or it, through the sem chat. Sem semaphores. Right, right. And uh, everything is done for you by our wonderful Mocha Media people. They provide you with everything you need. It's it it's pretty easy. Well, I would encourage anyone who's listening to this to see the film and then make it available to others, especially if you have any kind of a nuclear issue in your community. And let's face it, we all do. Mm -hmm. For now. Thank you for that discussion. And I want to turn this back over to Kimberly Roberson for the next pod of information, which is fabulous. So Kim, over to you. And thanks for uh, featuring us, uh, Kim. I, we really appreciate it. And I'm, we're grateful for our years of work with you and the effectiveness of your work. And oh, thank you so much. I just wanted to say one thing more, and that is, uh, J don't forget when you talk about Jim Turner, that he was a founding board member and a board member for Eon all the, until the end, <laughs> until Great. he died. Oh, mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll get to that for sure. Um, thank you so much for that really fascinating discussion. I remember when the title of your documentary was shut down. I don't know if that was a working title or if you were really. Yeah, before we, day. yeah. Mm -hmm. So just thank you so much for hanging in there and seeing it through to the point that you have, because this is the reality that we're facing. What's what's going to happen now once these reactors are shut down? And like you were saying before, I think on a phone call, this is a microcosm of what's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. So your documentary is just absolutely essential. And well, what I'd like to do now is, and you were involved in this next bit of work as well. So it's really appropriate that we kind of combine them. We're going to mix in what I call the FDA connection. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to show our audience an excerpt of your video that in the Eon video that was posted to your YouTube channel, I believe it still is, but it started on April, uh, 2013, April 6th, 2013. Wow. Hmm. Cindy Folker is a Beyond Nuclear. She's their radiation and health specialist. Gave this groundbreaking and very informative presentation as part of the two-day international symposium on the medical and ecological consequences of the Fukushima nuclear accident. It was held at the New York Academy of Medicine in New, in New York City, March 11th and 12th of 2013. The event was co-sponsored by the Helen Caldicott Foundation and Physicians for Social Responsibility. The information you're about to see remains relevant today after more than 6.2 thousand views on Eon's YouTube. So we'll watch Cindy's uh, presentation and we'll go from there. The first speaker is going to be Cindy Fokers, and she is going to talk about uh, post-Fukushima uh, food monitoring in the United States. I want to start out by thanking Dr. Helen Caldicott and Physicians for Social Responsibility for this symposium. It's amazing, and I want the public to know that you are getting information here that would not be readily available to us otherwise, and it's very important information. So thank, thank them from the bottom of my heart. So in general, testing of U.S. foodstuffs is inadequate. The U.S. limit of 1,200 becquerels per kilogram of just cesium-134 and or 137 is way too high. And it isn't binding, because the FDA can decide to act or not at any level of cesium contamination. So it's exactly like not having a standard at all. Japan, on the other hand, their limit is 100 becquerels per kilogram. Finally, release of info to the public is paltry, if at all. 
So what have they found so far? <clears throat> California kelp, iodine levels were significantly higher than before Fukushima. They didn't test it for cesium, and they should. They've asked for funding. I don't know if they've got it. I don't know an update on this, but this is important because kelp provides a food source for fish. So there is concern that contamination from the fish that eat the kelp will be concentrated within the fish. Pistachios grown in California were shipped to a Japanese supermarket. The Japanese supermarket tested 18 becquerels per kilogram of cesium 134 and 137. Beef raised in Japan was tested and approved for market sale and then recalled, but not before it was fed to Japanese school children. All of this beef could have been sold to the U.S. and the FDA may not have pulled it. California grass, 14 becquerels per kilogram, cesium-134 and 137. Grass, like kelp, is the beginning of a potential biomagnification chain which could concentrate cesium in cattle, for instance. And as Berkeley put it on their monitoring site, for understanding the time dependence of food chain results, the grass and soil is what to look at. Green tea, 162 kilograms of it shipped to France from Japan and rejected because of this level of contamination, 1,038. The U.S. recommendations would have accepted this. Bluefin tuna swam all the way across the Pacific and reached the California coast, retaining cesium-134 and 137. Canada's cesium limit is apparently 1,000 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. And news reports express concern that they will import very contaminated fish from Japan. It is a concern that the U.S. should also share. They were also concerned because contamination was higher in 2012 than it had been in 2011. And this fits with cesium's tendency to biomagnify, but we will have to stay tuned and we should keep measuring ocean fish from the Pacific for cesium. Because of the tendency to biomagnify, in general, we need more testing. And we need to think about how to test over a longer time frame, not just a few years. So how should we think about these contamination levels and how low should we attempt to make cesium contamination in our food? Remember two things. There's no safe level of radiation. Every exposure does carry some risk, no matter how small. And two, cesium-134 and 137 did not exist in nature before we created and released them. This graph is from ICRP report 111. ICRP stands for uh, International Commission on Radiological Protection. They recommend how much exposure is okay for humans. Governments follow these recommendations when setting standards. This graph shows us even what are considered very small amounts of cesium when ingested routinely can build up to unexpected levels in the body. <clears throat> so it specifically shows that after about three years, ingesting 10 becquerels per day of cesium-137 can cause a buildup to over 1,400 becquerels total cesium-137 in your body. For a child who weighs about 30 kilograms or about 66 pounds, this would be about 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137 in them. And this number is important because in studies of post-Chernobyl Belarus, cardiac abnormalities, heart problems, developed in children, who, children whose bodies contain 10 to 30 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. Irreversible myocardiopathologies develop at 50 becquerels per kilogram. Additional pathologies at these low levels can include hormone imbalances, angina, diabetes, and hypertension, which, by the way, are all sort of aging diseases as well. In addition to these diseases, as cesium passes out of your body, its radioactivity starts to damage your kidneys and your bladder, which in turn damages your body's ability to rid itself of the cesium. This could mean that your body could collect cesium more quickly than this graph currently shows, which means the total amount of cesium in your body would be higher over time than this graph shows from chronic ingestion. Why is the U.S. guideline so high? And how about Canada's? Well, it seems to be some sort of official policy to encourage people to accept increasingly radioactive food. Consider this quote also from ICRP Report 111. There may be situations where a sustainable agricultural economy is not possible without placing contaminated food on the market. 
As such, foods will be subject to market forces. This will necessitate an effective communication strategy to overcome the negative reactions from consumers outside the contaminated areas. So their plan consists not of informing the public that these contamination levels, what the contamination levels are so that we can decide for ourselves what is and is not appropriate. It consists instead of convincing us that man-made radiation in small doses is not harmful. Thank you. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw that clip, actually the entire presentation doesn't seem like that long ago, but it's been 11 years and much of it is unchanged. The FDA certainly has not taken the steps that they need to take. And that's part of why we've invited people to this event today to try to get some things done. Um, California grows roughly 40% of the agriculture in the United States. 40% of our food, of our produce. The US also imports Japanese seafood, green tea, think a popular coffee chain and their green tea matcha beverages that they dispense every day around the world and other foodstuffs that we import. Russia and China have now instituted total bans on Fukushima prefecture food, as well as other food produced throughout Japan. Food that is deemed unfit by those countries is being sent to the US because of the fact that we allow a certain level that other countries don't. And I'll get more into that. There is documented evidence of cesium-134 and 137 from Fukushima. Daiichi, going back to that clip that we saw in the first segment, the first video segment, Brian Williams of NBC News reported that 14 U.S. states registered radiation from Fukushima following the initial explosions and meltdowns there. Although he didn't talk about the explosions and meltdowns, just that 14 states as far east as Florida, as far north, I believe, as Vermont, there was, we know now, actually, we knew in the weeks following that um, it was detected in cow's milk as far east as Vermont. So those first reports of radioactive fallout compelled groups to take action with the Food and Drug Administration. It took us a little while to get it together. I had a couple of comment petitions that were out and then um, we submitted so our FDA citizen petition. The FDA's response, and in 2021, they lifted all food bans and all restrictions rather, sorry. They lifted all restrictions. Um, they did a, a mass restriction lift, I guess it was in April of 2021 and then another one in September. So now they're all gone and the food is just coming in. Uh, our petition that we wrote is still pending at the FDA. And what we called for was a decrease in uh, excessive radiation, man-made radiation from 1200 Becquerel per kilogram to um, five, as Cindy mentioned in the um, video. And what they've done, you know, and bear in mind too, that Japan's level is 100 Becquerel per kilogram. So anything that they deem unfit for their country is sent here. The EU has 1,250 Becquerel per kilogram limit. They're a little higher than us. I haven't seen this connection in print anywhere, but of course they're dealing with Chernobyl's radioactive fallout from 1987. Um, so over these past 10 years, actually 11 now, FDA has said they needed more time to respond because it's a complicated issue. We have documented letters from them that have been put in our docket on the FDA website by Jim Turner before he passed away. Um, I think it was a little over a year ago. Uh, boy, I miss him. <laughs> it would be great to have him with us tonight, but we're still waiting to hear of anything substantial. So far, it's just business as usual with letting this food into our country. During those past years, 13 years now, more than 1.3 million tons of radioactive wastewater has accumulated and it's being held in tanks at Fukushima Daiichi, 
More is added every day to keep the devastated reactor cores cool. It's all slated to be ocean dumped, as many of you know, regardless of the fact that it's only partially filtered. The FDA needs to act now to protect American consum consumers from seafood and other products that may be contaminated by their highly controversial and possibly illegal radioactive wastewater release or dumping. There are at least two lawsuits underway to halt TEPCO's plan and process. A separate webinar that will address those lawsuits and more is actually the April 13th Becquerel Awareness Day event that we're promoting. That information to join will be included in a follow-up email after this event. So here you see number one, Citizens for Health, Eon, Beyond Nuclear, and Fukushima Fallout Awareness Net Network filed the FDA citizen petition in 2013 to drastically lower allowable levels of man-made radiation in our food supply from 1,200 becquerels per kilogram to five. FDA's response was to lift all restrictions. The petition is still pending. Hmm. Your comments are still very much needed. Of course, a lot of, we have over 1,500 comments on that petition now. We need more, we need updated comments, people were leaving them 12 years ago where there was no, um, 11 years ago rather, where there was no connection to what's happening to the Pacific Ocean now. And we very much know now what's being dumped and the FDA really is not doing anything to respond except to say everything is fine. And of course, it's well within the levels that they have set to protect the public. But at 1200 Becquerel per kilogram, that's pretty much like having no protection at all, like Cindy said in the video. So in the follow-up email, I don't know if it'll probably go out tomorrow, possibly the next day, you will have a link, everyone watching, to comment to this petition, and we'll just keep rolling with it until we take some next steps. But we definitely need everybody here tonight to please just make a pledge that you will do that. Um, Last year, Becquerel Awareness Day featured a tribute to Jim Turner, one of the legendary original Nader Raiders. Jim was also founder director of Citizens for Health and the BC-based National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy, or NISLAP. NISLAP is now FAN's fiscal sponsor, and we vowed to continue his legacy. He was at the center of the citizen petition, helping to craft and then file it pro bono for us but we no longer have that kind of support. And there's really no way we could have done it without Jim. So we have to look forward to other ways now. Um, let me see here. I think that's probably all I need to say on that, checking the time. So I think now, unless I've forgotten something, I'm just double checking. We can go ahead to the Q&A. I think we have a little extra time for that, which is great. So if I could take over for the Q&A, Kim? That would be awesome. Thank you. If you have a question, please type it into the chat, and I will get to as many of them as I can in the little bit of time that we have left. For now, there was one that came by email earlier today by Jackie Dressler. She wrote, tonight, the president and first lady are hosting a dinner for the Japanese prime minister and his first lady, and there is salmon on the menu. Hmm. For the past several months, I have been getting pop-up ads from the Japanese Council of Fisheries extolling the health benefits of eating fish from Japan. I do not want to be harming people's livings and economies, but we know that the releases from Fukushima flow around the world and that people who eat fish with toxins in them harbor those toxins in their bodies. Is anyone doing anything to stop this marketing to the United States from Japan? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Actually, it's a promotion. You know, as the ICRP graph stated earlier in Cindy's presentation, it was all about figuring out how to place this contaminated food on the market and they had a plan for that. And that ICRP, I think, was updated to reflect that statement in April of 2011, after Fukushima obviously started. So 
you know, I've done several things. There was a meeting of at Camp David between Japan's prime minister, President Biden and the South Korean, I believe from uh, South Korean prime minister, I'm pretty sure, at Camp David late in the summer. And I tried very hard to get a message to them about this. I happened to know somebody who knew somebody who thought they could get a paper, a white paper to them. And uh, unfortunately that went full speed ahead. I mean, behind closed doors or on those paths of Camp David, they were making plans to continue to allow the US to accept this food. Um, it's really difficult to think that food that's deemed unfit for children in Japan is considered fine here uh, at 12 times the level. And we know that the internal ingestion can biomagnify and build over the years. So I think all of our frustrations, all of our questions right now really should be directed to the comment section of that FDA petition. It's preposterous that they're eating salmon right now. Over um, the summer, the White House actually hosted a sushi tasting event in the White House with the elite Japanese chefs with the tall white chef hats serving up sushi to members of Congress. And you have the um, oh, Rahm Emanuel, U.S. ambassador to Japan, is tweeting about how much he loves eating it, the delicacies, how he takes it home and gives it to his family. There's no problem. It's all very tightly knit to create this impression that it's safe. Now, some people make up their own minds about it. Some people don't want to stop eating the seafood in Japan, and they still do. I know people here who say, well, you tell me I shouldn't eat sushi, but you know what? I just love it so much, darn it. I just don't think I can give it up. So people are gonna decide what they have to do. There are things, steps we can take, common sense steps to protect ourselves, but um, really we need to send our comments to FDA ASAP. I mean, I hope some of you will do it today before you even do another thing. Um, you can actually search for the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network citizen petition on the FDA website and it will come up. Hmm. Other than that, we will send it to you in a follow-up email very soon. But yeah, it's definitely a frustrating problem for sure. I, I also read that um, Fukushima uh, uh, fishers men are, are understandably very upset about it and they are um trying to be uh um placated by having their fish sold to the US army yeah right, right. that's mm. i'm glad you brought that up i actually wrote an op-ed in the december issue of uh truth out uh because it really runs and direct, it's, it's directly opposed to President Biden's cancer moonshot program, which is on the White House website, their project to stop cancer at its source before it starts. And yet uh, the US government and military are taking it upon themselves to purchase the food that would have been the seafood from the Fukushima region that would have been sent to China and Russia. And instead they're feeding it to US service members stationed in Japan. Um, it was kind of an interesting process. I, I tried to get that op-ed published in other places. I even, I got a very nice rejection letter from the Military Times. Uh, with every rejection letter, I, I just hoped that somebody reading it would just take it upon themselves to take precautions or talk about it, even if they weren't going to publish it. Um, I don't believe that there are any kind of stickers on food being sold in Japan to the US military that states this is from the Fukushima region. I believe it's just, I mean, literally fish caught off the shore, a few miles off the coast. We don't know yet about the bioaccumulation, bioconcentration, biomagnification of this food, seafood or land-based food until studies are done over years. 
although we can look at the studies that were compiled by Tim Mousseau from University of South Carolina and Sarah Todd, those 250 studies showing the negative impacts, many of those in, uh, studies showing the negative impacts of ingestion of, of tritium. Mm -hmm. And then there's Arjun Makajani's book, uh, Exploring Tritium's Dangers, that came out less than a year ago, which specifically speaks to the need for improved policy in the United States as it deals specifically with tritium. So our petition is about cesium. We have a lot of new information now about tritium. Where one is found, the other is most likely there as well. So in the meantime, if we don't have enough scientific evidence and to prove to them, to the powers that be, that this is wrong, we have to launch a public awareness campaign or amplify it. And that's something else I'll be talking about mm. as we close. Okay, well, we have another question. I'd like to point out that there was a request made for links to the videos and they have been posted under chat. But we have a really good question from Alfred Meyer. He writes, the film SOS illustrates the, many, the very many significant problems at San Onofre in particular and at nuclear reactors in general. Can the filmmakers comment on the forces that are driving the nuclear enterprise? While the sales pitch is that nuclear power is an essential part of solving climate change, might the truth be that the military demand for nuclear weapons and the nuclear navy with which to deliver them is the real driving force of the nuclear enterprise? Thus, safety, cost, and waste issues are secondary to military goals. Mary Beth, Jim? Right, Alfred, we certainly agree. We've been writing about that too. Yeah, Albert has uh, uh, identified uh, the whole uh, encompassing context as the nuclear enterprise or the global nuclear enterprise. It, it refers to the seamless integration of weapons development, energy production, and nuclear waste production and management. It's a it's a, an integrated package that cannot be separated into separate strands. And uh, it's really important to recognize this, uh, that without uh, the infrastructure uh, supplied by commercial nuclear enterprises, the labor pools, the trained education, uh, training and education for uh, the employees and research facilities and so on, uh, there could be no nuclear weapons proliferation program. It's a codependent symbiotic process that needs to be acknowledged universally. And that's, it's really important that Albert uh, in his work is pointing out the seamless connection and the uh, inextricable connection between the three, what you might call the the real nuclear triad, <laughs> not you know it's it's a uh, weapons, energy, and waste production. Hmm. So thank you, Albert, for that trenchant comment, and we need to expand on it more and more. There was also a comment posted from Stephen Vogue listing a resource in radiation and cancer called Disproof of Any Safe Dose or Dose Rate of Ionizing Radiation with Respect to Induction of Cancer in Humans. It's through radical.org, and the link is listed um, in under the chat. Thank you. I also wanted to bring up that from after Chernobyl, I... Uh, and after Fukushima, I studied Chernobyl a lot more in depth and uh, read the work of Dr. Bandachevsky, who worked very um, closely with the children of Chernobyl and Belarus who had been so uh, damaged. And once you've got, um, you've been irradiated, you're so from an accident or the fallout from Fukushima, for instance, 
you're uh, much more vulnerable to other things happening to you. I mean, it took a lot less radioactivity for those children uh, to, you know, die. Mary Beth, can I can I just add? I'm so glad you brought that up. When I was talking before about it, about you know doing the studies, what they're waiting on is apparently to hear about studies or read what's going on with Fukushima now. But of course, we have the work of Bandyshevsky, and his research is still being supported by the European Commission. Hmm. It's ongoing. So thank you for for pointing that out. We do have that information. We do know that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that was mentioned in my truth out op-ed as well mm -hmm. so maybe i'll include a link with that in our follow-up email that we're putting together but anyway good, good idea so yeah i i yeah. actually put together a powerpoint presentation that to, focused a lot on bandachevsky's work i could put that out too oh that would mm -hmm. be great mm -hmm. yeah we'll talk about that okay I, I wanted to mention too with re regard to albert meyer's uh comment that he has uh, a number of articles on this topic i would recommend start with it's all about the bomb if you uh if you google that you'll get uh, an education straight away there's also a question from uh jan budar who is the co-author kim mentioned on tim musso's papers these papers are hard to access is there a way for us to get them without paying huge fees to El Sevier or other yeah. public publishers of scientific papers. And is that some information that perhaps you might be able to put in the follow-up email? Sure. There's a um, abstract of it published online under his name, Tim M-O-U-S-S-E-A-U -S -S -E and Sarah Todd also, the biological and health consequences of tritium. I think if you just type in that much, you'll see the... Um, the abstract come up, but I don't know of a way to access it without paying the fee at this time. I could check into it. Um, uh, I also would like to um, add a link to uh, Tim Musso's fabulous uh, presentation. He came out here into our area, and we right. did we did a program, and he we ha we have that online, and we'll put a link to that. Oh, that's great! Thank you. She doesn't want just the abstract. She wants the no, whole no, thing. No, no, I understand. She wants more information. <laughs> but I think the abstract also has information about how to, um, on the websites that it has been posted, I think there are ways to find out more information with the full publication. I just don't know it at the moment. So there are a few other uh, requests here for information. And I see, Mary Beth and Jim, that there is a listing for a link for free screenings of your mm -hmm. film. Tell us about that and when that's coming up. And that's beginning April 15th, um, which is next Monday, um, tax day. Um, and uh, for the whole week uh, ending at um, Earth Day. And you can watch our film free. Just go to sananofresyndrome.com and you can click the link. And uh, there'll be maybe a couple of clicks, but um, you can watch it for free. Excellent. And then we'll be offering it on video on demand for, you know, like $4.99 after that. I well, think... So there also be a screening, a uh, free screening period sponsored by the um, Sierra Club. Sierra Club coming up uh, later, and that's in June. And the uh, Pro Progressive Democrats of America will also be offering a national screening. Oh, that's on exciting. online. That's great. Mm -hmm. We'll be sure to put a link to all of this because it's on your website, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. up earlier, I'll be sure that that's included. Uh, lots of great information there. Absolutely. Also, what I'd like to do in the follow-up is include a link to Libby's interview with the both of you from September of last year. It was in-depth, maybe even more so than today, about uh, the making of your film and your process, and we'll have a link to that. Libby, did you want to talk a little bit more about Nuclear Hot Seat before I move on to the final words? I just invite anyone here who has not yet 
signed up for Nuclear Hot Seat. It's a weekly podcast that also gets broadcast through Pacifica on nuclear issues, 59 minutes every week. There are interviews, there are humor pieces. I have outside commentators as well. The goal being to give a running narrative of who we are, what we're going to going through, and give each other support, knowledge, information, and add a girls and add a guys to keep the show going. You, uh, there's no charge for it. Go to nuclearhotseat.com. There's a big yellow opt-in box. Fill that information out to sign up. And uh, it would be great to have you on board as this story continues, because there is no end to it. It's a great body of work, and uh, my hat's off to you for your lifelong service to this issue. <laughs> oh, my God, yes. I mean, in the, every week to every come up. Week. Uh, I mean, we had 12 years. <laughs> 13, 13. 13. I'm coming up on the start of the 14th in June. Oh, my gosh. How many episodes do you have? In the I just this morning posted number 668. Wow. Uh, and everyone, I mean, I just really want people to listen if you haven't yet, because Libby has her own inimitable style. And she's able to put in a little uh, humor and irony and bad puns. <laughs> huge fan. Biting sarcasm. Oh, yeah. You got to have that numb nuts of the week. That comes up every every episode. Almost every almost every episode. Oh, almost. It's 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 alternating now. Oh, that's right, because you have some new I have I have I have commentators from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons and also uh Nuke Watch in addition to Linda Pence Gunter of Beyond Nuclear, who right now is on sabbatical, but she's coming back in June. Oh great. And John LaForge. Who... John LaForge of Nuke Watch. Yes, he's on this week. And he gives a whole different perspective on NATO and Europe and the war and the protests and very Wonderful. different perspective. John LaForge. You're, you're, a, you're a one woman nu uh, media conglomerate. <laughs> <laughs> and you remember it all. That's what I <laughs> understand. You actually, you never blank. You always remember it. Um, well, okay. I'm looking at the clock. I think we're about ready to close. Do we have time for one more quick question? question is anything else before I close? Um, there, there are just reminders here. What I would suggest is uh, you can copy out the chat and you could use the chat as either inside the email or as an attachment to it so people can see what the entire stream was. Oh, also, okay. um, maybe you could... Um, put that into a PDF or something on the um, post oh. send out. Okay. We'll, we'll talk to our webmaster about that. Um, web tech. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and, and uh, wind down now. I've really enjoyed this. I'm so glad as many people were able to come as have. And I, again, you'll be receiving that email with other information. Um, this is just one event of four that Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network is hosting this week. We got wonderful luck in kicking off with this great interview and uh, program. Following this, uh, I have a GiveLify campaign launch announcement. Uh, we're going to start raising money to support governmental, public, and media outreach. Dan is raising funds for education on the food issue specifically with the goal of encouraging elected officials to push FDA to act on the citizen petition to drastically lower the current allowable levels of cesium-134 and 137 in our food supply. That's how the petition was originally written with the focus on cesium. Uh, as Cindy mentioned in her uh, presentation, we picked that one because other radionuclides are also present. Uh, it's really just the very beginning. So um, look for all of that great information in the follow-up. And again, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Libe. Thank you. And thank you, Kim, for putting this together because it's your vision, your drive, and your work that has brought us all together for this and for so much more. Oh, That's right. Thank you. It seemed like a no-brainer with Jim and MB or Mary Beth, sorry. No, that's fine. We're going to be coming on to talk about, you know, San Onofre because it just fits in with everything else, the bigger picture, 
and they've been working on the food issue as long as I have. It's, you know, what, 12 years now. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, right. It seems well, like thank you. Okay. Thank you again for your persistence. You bet. My pleasure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone.